Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Appraisal Buzzcast. We have a really exciting guest today uh, who's written a book that everybody should add to their summer reading list. Let me bring in Hal and we'll get him introduced. Hal, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Jim. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited for our guest today. Yeah, so today we have um, Mark Calabria, senior advisor to the Cato Institute. He's a former head of the FHFA, the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Mark's got a new book out, Shelter from the Storm, How a COVID Mortgage Meltdown Was Averted. Now, I realized as I was reading this book, Mark and I both have an affinity for the Grateful Dead. Mark, thank you for being here today. Uh, Hal, it's really a pleasure. And of course, uh, thanks to Jim as well for getting us started. Well, um, you know, I don't have as much time to read as I, as I would like, but I, I took the time over the weekend to read through your book. And when I got to the little blurb where you talked about Phil Lesh and the Grateful Dead, I mean, it's, it's not at all uncommon for me to get up on a Sunday morning and pop on um, Uncle John's band and just start the day off right. So that made me smile. I, 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 Hal, I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. And, you know, I wanted this to be more than just a, a dry policy book. I wanted to convey some of those feelings of, you know, being home during the pandemic with with your cat or dog and listening to, I, I oddly enough, probably spent more time in the pandemic listening to music than I usually do. Uh, hopefully that was the case for many of us. It was certainly a strange time, um, and, and I know a lot of people were hurting really bad, um, but there were some really positive things that came out of um, spending time with family and, um, you know, being at home more often. Uh, so, Mark, real quick, tell us, tell us a little, little bit about your background. Um, how long have you been in the game of kind of mortgage and finance regulation, and what is your experience with appraisals in the valuation industry? Great question. As you mentioned, I'm currently at the Cato Institute, was immediately before that running FHFA. Uh, immediately before that was chief economist for Vice President Pence at the White House, had been at Cato before and had spent a number of years on the, on the Senate Banking Committee, first with Phil Graham and then with Richard Shelby. Um, we had certainly examined appraisal issues at the time when I was in the banking committee. In fact, you know, residential real estate w was my area of responsibility for the committee. Okay. But honestly, a lot of this goes back, you know, even further uh, for me to say I graduated undergrad in the early 90s uh, during, you know, what was the aftermath of the savings and loan crisis. And, you know, one of the reasons I ended up going and getting a PhD was, quite frankly, the job market sucked. <laughs> right, <laughs> I mean, right. And so for me, my own choices were driven by kind of the aftermath of that boom and bust. Uh, and obviously, to a big to a big extent, that the landscape of the appraisal industry today really owes a lot to, um, you know, FIREA, FIDISHA, the, the, the legislative and, and structural aftermath of the savings loan crisis. And of course, that's notwithstanding, you know, the changes that were done in response to 2008. But in a way, we're really still dealing with the early 90s framework. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, that, you know, here's the thing. The reason I have people kind of give their background is to, to establish some bona fides for why they're talking about the topic they're talking about. Um, and, you know, speaking of the early 90s, I got into the business of valuation in the early 90s. I had a former boss, the last four digits of his phone number. I remembered it because I just called it the bad years and it was 8690. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I mean, those were those were crazy, crazy times. And of course, I should add, you know, I came out of grad school working at both National System Home Builders, National System Realtors, and, and obviously at NAR, uh, the appraisal industry has often ha had a, a partnership and an important voice. There's sometimes, you know, a tension, you know, between that industry as well, but an important relationship. And of course, as a a PhD in economics, have have, have early in my career done my fair share. Um, of, you know, hedonic AVM type modeling and understand what I think are both the pluses and minuses and limitations of that approach, of right. which it I has both. It. I love it. Well, let's take a quick moment to give a shout out to one of our sponsors and we will be right back. Since 1978, LIA Administrators and Insurance Services has been offering E&O insurance to valuation professionals. LIA applies superior customer service, exceptional liability education from Peter Christensen, 
and unparalleled claim defence managed by Claudia Gaglioni. LIA offers errors and omissions, commercial bonds, general liability, cyber liability, and real estate agents and brokers E&O. Visit liability.com or call 800-334-0652. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Hal Humphreys. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzz. Um, I'm joined by Mark Calabria today. Uh, He's got a new book out, Shelter from the Storm, How a COVID Mortgage Meltdown Was Averted. And I'm going to strongly recommend if you're in the evaluation profession, if you're in the lending profession, get a copy of this book. It's a really good read. Um, Mark, what what motivated you to write this book and what is the primary takeaway you'd like for your readers to get? Uh, I think so. You know, I I would admit foremost, I'm a book person. I think I, I appreciate the power of books. But I wanted to tell what I felt was an alternative con- to the conventional wisdom often in crises. Uh, and we see this now with the bank rescue, Silicon Valley Bank and others. And so, for instance, I wanted to tell a story how of during the crisis in 2020, we really were on the edge of a meltdown in the housing mortgage market. And we averted that, as the subtitle suggests. It wasn't by coincidence. It was me taking the lessons of 2008 in saying, I'm, were I ever in the position to do differently, I would do differently. And so it really is a walkthrough of how I think we should respond to crises. He's much more targeted, um, you know, much more cost efficient, you know, trying to reject bailouts is a whole conversation on stress among mortgage servicers and why do we didn't rescue them. Uh, and also how you can set up assistance programs that help people without discour- discouraging them going back to work and how you can actually pay for it all. So. I really felt like there was a difference to the, uh, you know, as I call it, rescue first, ask questions later approach that you often see from the Federal Reserve and others. And to really say there's another path and and it works. And I really wanted to lay out the rationale for that. So I hope it's a a real lesson in what works in government, but also a lesson for future crises and for what I think is a better way to respond. And in the world of books, and I'm a book guy myself, my wife and I have a, our front room is basically a library. It's bookshelves all over the place. So um, in the world of books, I can see this book become having a legacy because there are things that people in the future can look to in this book and possibly um, deal with things in a different way. You know, when I was reading the book and researching you and trying to get my head around who you are and what you do, it occurred to me, my, my degree is in uh, marketing and economics, so I have some grasp of economic theory, um, but I kind of envisioned you as a Swiftian economist, um, but you kind of staked your claim in this Keynesian-esque government intervention space. From your perspective, what role should the government play in supporting the housing market? So I would like to see a far more minimalist role. And certainly, you know, the, the in a sense, a the theme of the book is making the best of a bad situation, you know, if, if you will. I think our the industry is way too concentrated in, in the, you know, the influence that Fannie and Freddie and the federal government have over, you know, forcing a single set of rules on almost everybody in the industry. You know, I'm a believer in competition and I would rather have a more a multipolar mortgage market, if you will, where we have a lot more diversity and choices and and, and especially secondary and, 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 of course, more stability in the mortgage market. But a theme of the book was, you know, when I took over FHFA, you know, my role, I characterized myself as an, an Article One constitutionalist. And what I mean by that is the big decisions are made by Congress, hence Article One of our Constitution. And my role of a regulator was not to second guess Congress. It's fine as a, as a pundit and author to argue, should we have Fannie and Freddie or not? But when you're their regulator, they're there. What do you yeah. do? You carry out the law. Uh, and I really kind of saw the book as an alternative to perhaps some of the more um, big, big government. You know, there are elements of Keynes I actually agree with and elements I don't agree with because I've actually read it. And and and, <laughs> and, 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 and I think actually Keynes would probably disagree with a lot of modern Keynesianisms, but that's a whole another conversation. Sure. But the point of how do you have an intervention? And we really ran the forbearance and intervention programs at Fannie and Freddie in a way that I think you'd run it as a business. They weren't run as a charity. Uh, Obviously, when you were having courthouses closed down and you were having a pandemic, 
it was not in Fannie and Freddie's business interest to start trying to foreclose on people, you know, in spring of 2020. And I think a really good indicator, we set up our programs pretty quickly. And those parts of the mortgage industry, you know, portfolio lenders, PLS, they almost to a T mirrored what we did and they had no obligation to do so. And right. I think if we had done something that was costly and reckless and, and short-sighted, I don't think the rest of the industry would have copied it. Right. Perfect answer. Uh, let's take another quick moment and give a shout out to another one of our sponsors and we will be right back. The Appraisal Institute recently launched its Instagram page, AI's latest presence on social media, joining Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and the Face Value podcast. Visit and follow AI's Instagram page for another way to access valuation news and association updates. www.instagram.com slash appraisal institute. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Hal Humphreys. You're listening to Buzzcast. I'm joined today by Mark Calabria. Mark, thank you again for being here. I want to talk a little bit about risk. Um, you know, in, in the mortgage lending space, there are two sides to the risk equation, credit and collateral. In your book, you know, you have a, a chapter where you talk specifically about you had some, you weren't particularly comfortable with some of the alternatives to traditional appraisals. Um, you also note that these alternatives seem to be more about gaining a competitive advantage for Fannie and Freddie and less about getting accurate home appraisals. Now, <clears throat> I've had long conversations with several friends um, on the capital market side of things, the people who end up buying these tranches of loans. And this is absolutely anecdotal based on my conversations, but they seem to prefer traditional appraisal products. They want a human being to go look at the property, to analyze that side of the risk. I've had several of them mention um, that when a tranche of loans has too many non-traditional valuations, they'll actually charge additional risk premiums for purchasing those loans. Do you think that traditional appraisals are still necessary to address the collateral side of the risk equation adequately? I, I do. And, and one of the reasons, maybe I should say two of the reasons I talk about this issue in the book. The first is, you know, we put in place a number of flexibilities during COVID that were geared at protecting the health of the appraisal industry and the borrower. Keep in mind, you know, we all think back to 2020, you know, we often didn't know what transmission was. You, the appraiser, didn't necessarily want to go in somebody's house and they didn't want you in the house, but we wanted to be able to keep the industry doing. But one of the points I really wanted to write about the book and, and, and emphasize is these were meant to be temporary responses to a pandemic. They were not meant to be, you know, the flexibilities on drive-by appraisal and such. These were not meant to be permanent. Uh, and for that reason as well, we lowered like allowable LTVs. We we knew that this would introduce additional error into the process. Uh, we set up a review process. So every few months we'd look back and say, are we seeing early payment problems? And so this was never, this was a Band-Aid meant for a crisis, not to meant to be a permanent structural change. Uh, and then the other thing I really wanted to write about was I was honestly just shocked when I entered FHFA and started talking to Fannie and Freddie. And I'll tell you, particularly Freddie, there really was this view that the appraisal process was just a bump in the road. Or, or, or the number of times I would hear uh, the GSEs, you know, describe it as a friction, you know, to be eased out of the system. And I'm like, no, this is an important safeguard. Uh, and obviously the problems we saw at Zillow and such, you know, it demonstrated the, the limitations of, of an AVM approach. But you really saw this attitude of the GSEs of like, you know, we're smarter, we've got the data, we don't need, you know. And so it was really concerning to me, which of course is why I began a request for input, a public process uh, where we could hear from stakeholders. And and I don't know what, you know, that was not concluded by the time the Supreme Court decided to put me out of a job, but I thought it was critical that we heard from the industry uh, in that we, you know, maybe we end up in the same place, but at least we have a deliberation and an open thoughtful process to get there. Uh, and, and my feeling was that was not what was happening. I love it. Um, you know, we are an appraiser centric publisher. Um, I have been a lifelong appraiser. I was holding the dumb end of the tape for my dad when I was 13 years old. Um, and I think real estate appraisal is a necessary part of the risk analysis equation. Um, and there are places 
where an AVM works. There are places when alternatives can work, but I think by and large for our appraiser listeners, um, there is going to be work going forward for appraisers. It is a necessary part of the risk analysis um, in the mortgage lending industry. Mark, thank you so very much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we're going to be hosting Valuation Expo in August. Um, I plan to carry a couple of these books to give away to some people. Um, I, I cannot say enough good things about the book. Fantastic job. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Hal. I really appreciate the, the kind words. And I really wish everybody the best luck and emphasize, you know, that the, their industry really does need to, to raise its voice. There are a, a lot of people in Washington that that would do away with this part of the industry. And again, I can't emphasize, you know, the importance of this issue. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Jim Morrison, you still with us? Absolutely. That, that was a great conversation. We're going to put a link to buy Mark's book uh, in the description and, and put it up right here so that people can go get it. I recommend everybody go out and get that. We also have upcoming Mark has an interview with Joan Trice and the Cloud Risk Network at 2 p.m. on June 14th. Uh, so if you're a CRN member, I would get that in buy the book and then you'll have questions prepared for them. Absolutely. Well, um, for Jim Morrison and Mark Calabria, I'm Hal Humphreys, and that is your Appraisal Buzzcast. <laughs>